Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is February 6, 2024. It's a Tuesday. Uh, I'm Rifat Mannan in California, and today we are continuing with the second lecture in the hematopathology lecture series. And our today's guest is none other than Dr. Jeffrey Maderas, who needs no introduction to the people in the hematopathology world. And he's a very renowned hematopathologist, and he is currently the professor and chair in the Department of Hematopathology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And today he is going to give a talk on diffuse large cell lymphoma. And at this moment, I would like to thank Dr. Aaron Orbach for helping us in organizing these hematopathology lecture series. We are really thankful. And I also want to give a big shout out to our HEMPAT uh, fellow at City of Hope, Dr. Zach Reed, for his enthusiastic support. And thank you, Dr. Medeiros, for joining us today. Over to you now. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for asking me to participate. I'm going to make my face go away now. And we're going to just go forward with this talk. So here's a little outline of what's coming. And we'll start with an introduction uh, to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So I thought we'd start with this business about the two classification systems. As you know, the WHO and the ICC are out there. Uh, and if you look at this recent abstract from uh, Andrew Feldman at the Mayo Clinic and look down here where my pointer is, They've looked at about a thousand cases and they see uh, significant discrepancies in 0.8% uh, of the terminology in the two different systems. So in effect, to me, these two classification systems are equivalent and I don't see any value about talking about both of them. So I'm just going to talk about the WHO classification of these 0.8% discrepancies. One of them is in the area of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. We'll cover that when we get there. Here's a little uh, picture of uh, large B cell lymphomas in the in the WHO classification. Uh, I put the word diffuse in parentheses because it's not required for every one of these 17 different subtypes. I think you can divide these subtypes into four large groups. This is my own idea. Nobody nobody talks about this but me, I guess. I mean, you can sort of talk about the ones that have distinctive morphologic features or immunophenotypic features. And then there are some that are pretty much genetically defined. And then there are some that are, you know, unique biologically, but also raise very important clinical issues like mediastinal large B cell lymphoma, brain lymphoma, testis lymphoma. And lastly, there are the lymphomas that are viral driven of all these different types of lymphoma that are out there now, still about 80% of all the cases of diffuse large B cell lymphoma not otherwise specified. So here's the definition in the WHO5 beta version. It's a lymphoma of medium sized large B cells, diffuse growth pattern. This is not a morphologic or molecular homogeneous entity. It's very heterogeneous, right? So I would suggest that the definition of diffuse large B cell lymphoma is very old fashioned. Large cells, diffuse pattern, B cells. With that kind of old fashioned definition, I think it's no surprise it's a very heterogeneous entity, right? So here's your basic picture of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The criteria for this diagnosis have not changed very much since about, I don't know, 1981 when uh, CD20 was first reported. I think it was B1 back in the days when Dr. Lee Nadler first described it. Now here's going back to the 17 subtypes. Today, I'd like to focus on three types. I'd like to talk about diffuse large BNOS, which is most of them. As part of this, I'd like to talk a little bit about the double hit lymphomas. And then if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit about the high grade B lymphoma NOS category, which is only 2% of all of the cases. As you know, with, with people with diffuse large B, the treatment, the standard therapy is pretty much rituximab plus CHOP, right? And Dr. Coiffier, who now, who died a few years ago, I believe of lung cancer, when he was in charge of the big French group, Gila, now it's called Lysa, I think, showed that adding rituximab to CHOP improved survival of patients with diffuse large B. For those who don't remember, CHOP was invented in the 70s by people at Stanford and also some people here at MD Anderson. So, you know, a lot of the research in diffuse large B cell lymphoma is who does and who doesn't do well 
when they get out of chop therapy. Let's talk a little bit about the clinical picture. Here's a paper out of China. Uh, I sounded like Trump there, didn't I? China, uh, median age, okay, six decade, but big broad age range, slightly more men, B symptoms. This study, it's a little low. I think it's higher in our hospital. Bulky disease, 10%, high serum LDH, a measure of tumor burden, almost half the patients. These tumors can be nodal or extranodal or both. Patients uh, in this study were more often low stage but and high disseminated disease less common. Other studies say it's 50-50. Bone marrow involvement is about 10% in this paper. I think when you use flow cytometry and things like that, it's probably more like 15%, because it's kind of minimal, but there. Now, when clinicians talk about diffused large B cell lymphoma, they don't really talk about, they always add more, right? So, you know, hey, Joe, look at my patient with diffused large B, right? They also then talk about the International Prognostic Index, right? The IPI. And here's the original paper from 1993. And you can sort of misspell the IPI with apples with, without the second P. And so each one of these, age less than 60, more than 60, that's a point. Performance status, zero means you're walking around pretty good, four means you're in bed, you know, looking bad. Serum LDH, normal elevated, a number of extra nodal sites, less than one or one or less or more, and stage, right? Each one of these is a point. If your IPI is zero, I think things are, there's a very good chance you're going to do well with therapy. If your IPI is five, um, you know, you better check your paperwork before you undergo the therapy, right? Because you know you may not do well. Now, people have tried to improve the IPI. Here's one from the uh, National Cancer Center Network few years ago, and, and they're just trying to make the IPI a little, a little more granular, right? I mean, so, and I, I think that makes sense to me, right? I mean, whether you're 40 to 60, certainly you're probably better off than if you're over 75, right? Or the LDH, I mean, whether it's less than three times high or over three times high, that's probably a difference too, right? And they point out in this system that when you have disease in the marrow or the brain, particularly the brain, the liver, the GI tract, or the lung, these are bad places to have lymphoma. So it's not just like, any extranodal site. Some are worse than others in terms of prognosis. So I, I think this kind of thing is valuable, trying to improve the IPI, but most people don't remember it. Most people just use the old one. How about the morphology of diffuse large B? I mean, I think we all see cases. Yeah, on the left here, I'm showing you a centroblastic case, which is most common. I think you can see the vesicular chromatin, a little tiny peripheral nucleoli. On the right, I'm showing a case that looks very immunoblastic to me with the central nucleolus, the little spider legs coming off the nucleoli. Now, I know we all say that it's not easy to tell these things apart, and sometimes it isn't for sure, but sometimes it is. And here's a paper coming out of Germany uh, years ago now. German Ott is the first author showing that the centroblastic patients tend to do a little better than the immunoblastic patients. So, you know, when we say morphology means nothing, well, that's a bit of an oversimplification in my mind. The immunoblastic variant seems to do worse. And of course, one possible explanation for that is that the immunoblastic variant has a higher frequency of MIC rearrangement uh, than centroblastic variant. There's also cases like this. Here's an anaplastic ugly guy. Look at this case, right? And this, they often have CD30 when they look like this, and they often have TP53 mutation, which is always a bad thing in my opinion. Here's a case in the bone that looks very spindly, almost like a sarcoma. I've seen cases in the bone called sarcoma. So basically, I've mentioned to you some variants here, and there are some rare variants on the right side of the column. And, you know, I think there's very little known about correlating the morphology with the genetic picture, right? I mean, people, the way the field is right now, you know, cases of diffuse large B are sent to some science group and they grind them up and do all the genetic testing and uh, they show the differences in uh, various types of diffuse large B, but nobody bothers to try to correlate what the tumor looks like with the genetic information, or at least not many people bother, or I haven't found the papers where that's dealt in any detail, and possibly because the central blastic is so common, this would be harder to do. But in my opinion, it should be done. And I suspect that if we had access to the genetic data and, and we went back to the morphology, we might be able to predict with some 
semblance of precision some of the different kinds of genetic features, right? So this is a place only we can address, and I think we should try. Now, one more thing about morphology before we leave it, and that is, you know, the starry sky pattern is a bad thing. In my experience, if a patient has a starry sky pattern, they're not going to do great. So I think it's worth noting this in the PATH report when it's there. Not that anybody, I mean, the clinicians may not listen, but I certainly would pay attention if you told me you had a, a case with a starry sky pattern. And of course, we know this pattern has a very high proliferation rate with key 67, and we know they have a higher frequency of MIC rearrangement, right? All right, enough about morphology. Let's move to immunophenotype. So, you know, in the old days, like when I was training, because I'm old, you saw my picture, I have gray hair. Uh, you know, immunophenotype was mostly diagnosis. Now... Diagnosis is still important, but we're using markers for prognosis. And of course, we're using these markers to identify uh, targets for therapy, right? And the best example of this is rituximab, right? I mean, you can look at a case of diffuse large B. You can do, uh, I don't know, PAX-5. You can show it's a B-cell tumor. And you can tell the clinician that's what it is. And, and the clinician's probably going to say, well, what about CD20, right? Because it's not just a matter of the diagnosis. He wants to use rituximab. And you don't want to use it if it's not going to work. So if you have a, one of the variants of diffuse large B, which is CD20 negative, maybe you don't want to use it, right? Because it's like $8,000 a course in the United States. anyway. So you don't want to waste it. Now, there's a whole bunch of targets out there for which therapies are working. There's a recent paper showing that abrutinib works pretty well in the CD5 positive diffuse large B cases. There's the anti-CD19 antibody. There's brentuximab, which acts against CD30 positive tumors. We think of it more in terms of anaplastic large cell lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma, but 10% of diffuse large Bs are 30 positive. There's CD38. There's CD79B and polituzumab vedotin, which is, a you know as you know, is a drug of uh, 79A hooked up to a linker and then a toxin, a tubulin toxin. It's a lot like brentuximab in structure, same, same company. And uh, they've shown that this is improving uh, the survival of patients with diffuse large B by above 7%, mostly in the non-GCB group. Uh, the tazimetostat, which is uh, in the EZH2 inhibitor at the uh, histone 3 lysine 27 area. And this BRAF, this BCL2 venetoclax is big. And then, of course, we know about the checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that every tumor be studied for all these markers, but I think in each hospital, there's probably two or three clinical trials going on using one of these markers. And then, you know, your clinicians are going to want you to look at those markers for their trials. Um, how about chromosomal translocation? So, you know, here's a list of uh, most of the ones that occur in diffuse large B. I mean, there may be a few other rare ones. Of course, BCL6 is most common, BCL2 next. But the one in red here I'm putting out is MYC, which is 8 to 10% of all cases. And I just want to talk a bit about MYC because here's a paper in JCO showing that the patients with MYC rearrangement do worse than the patients without MYC rearrangement, right? Now, some people suggest that, that it's the double hit cases in the MYC rearrangement group that make this group worse. But other people say, no, MYC rearrangement by itself is also a bad thing. Now, how do you detect MYC rearrangement? We all know how this works. There's typical conventional cytogenetics, which is fabulous, but you know it's not often that we have the fresh tissue. And certainly some people would say conventional cytogenetics is passe. I think they're wrong, but everybody's entitled to their opinion, right? Then you got the fish. We all use that. And then next generation sequencing. I think this is where it's going to go. I think before this is done, NGS will be the standard technique. But right now we're all pretty much using fish and where most most of us are beginning with the break apart probe uh right they're spaced out one orange one green uh when you don't have a rearrangement that looks yellow i think the normal you can see some yellow there when there is a rearrangement it breaks and the red and green separate this is sort of the standard technique most of us are using most of the time we have paraffin embedded tissue which is why we use it so that's an interesting technique we'll come back to that now, I'd like to move from sort of those techniques, the cell of origin. So here's this. Let's go back to the beginning. This is like, uh, I think this is the first big famous paper on gene expression profiling in diffuse large B, right? It includes Dr. Alizadeh, who's at Stanford, 
Dr. Eisen, I think, is still at Berkeley, Cal Berkeley, and Dr. Stout, of course, is at the NIH. And, um, you know, they basically took these uh, genes, germinal center B cell genes, and activated lymphocyte genes and some other B cell genes, and they basically attached them to a nylon membrane. And they called that the lympho chip, which I think is very stylish. Now it's called Aphometrics, you know, 30.21 or something like that. Um, and, you know, as you all know, we take the, the tumor tissue, we need it fresh for this, we make the RNA, we hybridize the RNA to the lympho chip, the membrane. If it sticks, that's overexpression. If it doesn't stick, that's underexpression, right? Then you put it in some sort of scanner. And this uh, picture, red was overexpression, green was underexpression. And they took a whole bunch of diffuse large bees here and and you can see one group is sort of red green and one group is sort of green red and this is gcb and this was abc and there here they have some resting b cells activated b cells germinal center b cells for comparison so based on this they say that looks kind of similar and so they came up with the whole the whole deal there and then they went and they did this right they showed that the gcb guys did better than the apc guys and then they did the ipi low versus high and that makes perfect sense and then they took just the low ipi guys and the GCB guy did better than the ABC guys, right? So this was big news. All the patients were being treated with CHOP at the time, right? Because they're pulling tissue out of the banks from the 1990s to do this work. <clears throat> so they had to do it again in a few years on people that were treated with our CHOP because I think rituximab kind of came into vogue for diffuse large B in the early 2000s. And they go show again that the GCB guys do better than the ABC guys. And then they also in this study show that, you know, 10% of the patients are unclassifiable using this gene expression technique. Okay, so when we say GCB, uh, non-GCB or ABC, we should say ABC here. I'll come to non-GCB in a bit. Um, what do we mean? So here's a little cartoon of a germinal center. Uh, I think you can see the dark zone, the light zone up top. SHA stands for somatic hypermutation. CSR stands for class switch recombination. Uh, down on the left corner, I don't know if you see my pointer or not. You can see a reactive germinal center from a tonsil. I just put it here to show you. You can see the dark zone and you can see the lighter zone. So the dark zone here is where the B cells go into. They see the antigen. They become central blasts. Some of them die. Others you know, are selected by T follicular helper cells and, we, and they mature onto centrocytes and then some become memory B cells, some become plasma cells in the end, right? So basically the left hand of the picture, the dark zone is pretty much the germinal center B cell area. The light zone is pretty much the activated B cell area. Now, you know, when this came out, uh, I've been here a long time now and the clinicians were all over me to set up gene expression profiling routinely on every new case of diffused large B. And of course, when I said that was a bit of a problem, they uh, acted like I was Mr. Neanderthal, old fashioned pathologist, not willing to advance with the times. I don't know if you ever have clinicians treat you like you're old fashioned or something. They don't understand, they didn't understand, at least the people here didn't understand that even the places that were writing this paper, Nebraska, Stanford, NIH, were not doing it routinely. And there were a lot of reasons for that. It's not just a matter of getting the fresh tissue, making RNA and hybridizing to a membrane. There's a lot of bioinformatics involved. And most of us didn't have bioinformaticians that could do it. So basically, Nebraska came out with this immunohistochemical algorithm as a surrogate for gene expression profiling. And Chris Hans was a fellow at the time. She is now a practicing dermatopathologist in the Nebraska Omaha area somewhere. So this was a hierarchical system. If the tumors are positive for 10, you call them GCB. If 10 is negative, you can look at the MUM1. And if it's positive, it's not GCB. If it's negative, you do the, the BCL6. And if it's positive, now it's GCB again. And if it's negative, it's non GCB, right? And the cutoffs for these markers were 30%. Uh, that's a completely arbitrary number as far as I can tell. And I don't believe for a minute that anybody ever counts 100 cells and comes up with a number like 31 or 27. I think it's all done ballpark by almost everybody I know. 
Uh, and when you use this technique, you can match the gene expression profile in about 80% of the patients, which is not bad, right? So now I want to ask you, if I am signing out cases here and I get them right 80% of the time, so that means I'm wrong 20% of the time, how long do you think I'm going to be able to stay here before somebody decides I should retire, right? So why would 80% be considered acceptable? Because they were all being treated with RCHOP anyway. And so this was a way to sort of subdivide patients and stimulate, stimulate the research about them, even if it wasn't a perfect method. So it's very popular. Everybody uses the Hans algorithm pretty much. A paper's been cited about 3,000 times. So, I mean, this is a pretty popular piece of work, right? Now, I just want to show you one example of cell of origin by IHC. So, you see CD10 looks negative. Now, the MUM1, is that 30% for you or not? And then here's the BCL6. That's certainly 30%. And then the MUM1, even if you think it's 30%, it's kind of weak, no? And the BCL6, very strong, right? So, should you be calling this case GCB or non-GCB? Right, I think the MUM1 party makes 30%. And if you do, then you'd say it's non-GCB. But if you don't believe that, or if you're influenced by the BCL6, then you might say, that's yeah, a GCB tumor. I think this kind of highlights this one case. This is just as one real case, uh, how this GCB ABC business or non-GCB business, right? Because when you use IHC, you don't call it ABC, you call it non-GCB. How this non-GCB business is, you know, it's a little bit uh, iffy. All right, when CD10 is clearly strong, no problem. But when 10 is negative, I think this is the area where things can be misclassified by IHC compared to the gene expression profile. All right, let's talk a little bit about gene mutations. And here's a big paper by, uh, gee, I think Dr. Reddy from Duke wrote this one, I think. But forgive me, Dr. whoever it is listening, if it's not Dr. Reddy's paper. Uh, so this nice paper looked at a lot of cases that diffuse large B. They showed 150 or so gene mutations occur in diffuse large B. Uh, you know, like a lot of these things, uh, certain genes are relatively common, 20% maybe, and then it fades off to 1%, a tail, long tail. Basically, in this paper, the average was 17 mutations per case of diffuse large B. Why would these mutations occur? Uh, the authors concluded that most of them were aging. The normal aging leads to some of these mutations. And also you can have uh, activation-induced cytidine deaminase in the germinal center, which can lead to some of these somatic hypermutations. When you look at where the mutations are, they, they basically involve uh, one, two, three, four, like eight different pathways, right? B-cell receptor signaling, toll-like receptor signaling, lymphocyte differentiation, DNA repair, mostly TP53, lymphocyte activation. Chromatin modification is a big deal, either by DNA methylation or acetylation. And I think the more we learn about lymphomas, both B and T, the more this chromatin modification thing's becoming a big deal. And then immune surveillance, which, and these last two categories, chromatin modification, immune surveillance, were not even known as far as I know until people started doing next generation sequencing studies on diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Now I made this little cartoon, including rearrangement mutations, just to sort of show you that uh, there are differences. The cell of origin does correlate with differences. For example, all the MIC rearrangements, all the IGH, BCL2 translocations, they're all in the GCB group pretty much, whereas BCL6 is much more common in ABC. And then I think you can see chromatin modification, like EZH2 down here, KMT2D and C here. This is more GCB. And then things like uh, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, activating inhibitor protein 3, MYD88, CD7, and AB. This is more NF kappa B, and this is more common in the ABC group, right? So even though I complained and said that the cell of origin, you know, isn't, uh, you know, at least if you do IHC, uh, it's not right all the time. It does give some information to clinicians about what targeted therapy might work if the patient fails our chop. Now, there, in addition to these GCB ABC differences, here's a paper by Ken Young looking at TP53. And Ken Young was here for many years, but now he's like vice chair, I think, at Duke. He's a big guy now. And I think you can see these 
TP53 mutations correlate with poor prognosis, whether it's all the cases, the GCB cases, the ABC cases. So there are sort of mutations that are cell of origin specific or highly preferential. And then there are mutations like TP53 that don't respect the system at all. They occur in both arms of the of the dichotomy and, and patients do poorly with TP53. And that's not just true for diffuse large B. I don't think there's a hematologic neoplasm that doesn't do worse if TP53 is mutated, right? And that may be true for all solid tumors, but I don't specialize in solid. All right, let's talk a little bit about some newer studies that I think are interesting. Uh, and these, when I say new, they're five years old now, but still interesting. So here's this paper by the NIH, Dr. Stout again. They look at 574 cases. They're only able to classify about half of them. So you can see the system needs some work. But they basically say diffuse large B can be divided in four subgroups. There's this EZB1, which is named after EZH2 mutations and BCL2 translocations. That's very much like a follicular lymphoma phenotype. Then you got the BN2 group with BCL6 fusions, notch 2 mutations, more of a marginal zone look. Then you got the MCD1s, MYD88, and CD79B mutations, and then this N1 group, notch 1. And if you look over here at the survival curves, I think you can see EZB and BN2 are doing better then MCD and uh, N1. So this is like maybe one of the first steps showing that uh, diffuse large B is far more complicated than GCB versus ABC. Now, this is another paper coming out of Boston, the same year, and, and I don't remember perhaps the, the same dates. And this is from uh, Dr. Ship is a big shot at the Dana-Farber, right? She's a native Houstonian, by the way, but she works up in Boston, has been for years. Uh, so this is another study. They got 300 cases here. They're doing the same thing. Gene expression profiling, copy number alterations, mutations. I think the little boxes here show the sort of subgrouping I'm trying to show on the upper right. Unlike the NIH group, which is classifying half, these guys are classifying virtually all of them. And there's only 12 cases in the C0 group that were unclassifiable, right? Now, notice C1, BCL6 translocations, notch 2, right? N of kappa B. Let's just go back. That looks a little bit like BN2, doesn't it? And then we've got the C2 category, TP53, P16s, you know, RB1. Okay, then we have the C3 group, BCL2 chromatin modifier G mutations. This is looking a lot like EZB, no? This is a chromatin modifying mutation, EZH2, and BCL2 translocations. And then we've got the immune evasion genes. And then we have this category 79B, MYD88. Now I suggest to you that looks a lot like MCD. So these two studies using different tumors, but similar methods are showing some similarities. And if you look at the uh, survival curves for the study from Boston, I think you can see uh, in this first one, GCB, C4 is better GCB, C3 is lesser good GCB. Here's the ABC group, better and worse. And then here's the C2 group. So clearly this system seems to be more granular than the GCB ABC system that we talked about first. Now here's another paper coming out of England, uh, the UK, I should say, right? Uh, and this is different from the others. The others are using gene expression profiling and copy number alterations and NGS mutations. This one's just using NGS with about a 300 gene panel. Uh, and you can see they've got a BCL2 group that I would suggest to you looks a lot like uh, the uh, the same group with the other two studies, the EZB, you know, and the, um, I think it was C3, right? And they have a notch two group, a lot like the BN2 group and the, I forget which one it was, C2 maybe. And then they have the MID88, which is like MCD, right? So these guys using just gene mutations are showing very similar groups. And then they have a couple other ones here. And NEC stands for unclassifiable. They have a fair number of unclassifiable ones, right? So they classified 73% of the cases in this particular study. All right, so I'm showing three different studies now that seem to be agreeing with each other about some of the subtypes of uh, diffuse large B. 
And the NIH group comes back, this study by Wright and Dr. Stout's last author again, and they sort of, they developed this thing they call the lymph gen classifier. And based on the studies of others, they kind of do a little pruning of their previous system. They improve it a little by adding A53 and they add the ST2 group. Uh, and, you know, this is based on, I think this is serum glut glutathione kinase one and TET2, of course. And they break them out into a couple additional groups. And I like this, uh, this slide for a number of reasons. Number one, it gives you the frequency of these groups. I think you can see that column. There's some differences in behavior based on these groups. I think you can see that column. But I think what's really nice about this picture is look at the original GCB and ABC groups to the left and the unclassified group in the middle and look where they are now. Even though a lot of ABCs went to MCD, some went to N1, some went to A53, some went to BN2, some went to ST2, some went to GCB. So isn't that interesting? So it just, to me, it just shows how inadequate the original cell of origin system was. So now I'm just trying to compare the three groups in one slide. This comes out of a Modern Path editorial. So I should say I'm stealing it from Dr. Hodson, I think is the last author. So here's lymph gen in the first column. Here's the modified UK system. Histologic Malignancies Research Network is what those letters stand for. Here's the Harvard system by Dr. Ship uh, and team. Dr. Bjorn Chapui, I think, is the first author. I, I don't know if that's the way you say his name. Apologies to him if he's listening. And, you know, I think you can see that there are some similarities. The MCD group is like the MYD88 group is like the C5 group. The main mutations, MYD88, CD79B, PIM1, sort of correlates with the ABC cell of origin. The outcome is generally poor, and the tumors most often in this group include the primary CNS lymphomas, the primary testicular lymphomas, right? Let's go to row number two. The EZB group correlates with the BCL2 group, correlates with the C3 group, and we're looking at BCL2 translocations and EZH2 and CREB-B and KMT2D, which are chromatin-modifying genes, right? They're almost all germinal center B cell, Depending on whether MYC is present or absent, they're good or bad, and mostly these are follicular lymphoma. And when MYC is present, these are the double hit cases. I think BN2, I think I don't know if I have to go through any more of these, but you can see the similarities, BN2, notch 2, C1, notch 2, BCL10, could be ABC, could be GCB, better prognosis, and they kind of look like marginal zone lymphomas. The ST group, ST2 group includes some that look like notch LP, some look like prior mediastinal large B, so I think you can see that a system seems to be evolving. So what's the take-home points from all the stuff I just gave you? Because you're not going to remember it all, right? First of all, the cell of origin model, GCB, ABC, is not sufficiently granular to predict a prognosis or plant therapy. So that's a nice way of saying it didn't work very well. And you know, if I may just say as an old guy, it didn't work very well when they first published it. And I was disappointed. I'm like, really? This is all you've got for me after all of this gene expression profiling business? And of course, you know what they said then? Oh, you know, you're old fashioned. You're a Neanderthal. You don't want to progress. But it was pretty clear to at least me that the GCB ABC model was not going to be very helpful. Um, not, but And I think now it's becoming proven. Not, nonetheless, even though I'm trashing it, uh, the WHO 5 says we better use this until we get something better and more practical, right? because that's all we have. And it does give some information to clinicians in terms of what they might want to use to treat a patient, particularly if they fail our job. Uh, now this new model, you know, is clearly gonna, it may not lead to optimal therapy yet, right? It's gonna take some, it's gonna take a little while, but I think this system is gonna be, has to be part of clinical trials, right? And I think any new trial now really needs to get you're going to put a couple million dollars into a clinical trial. I think the cases need the optimal molecular workup because it not only will be valuable for that trial, it will be there sort of like a library for other trials. And then this last point is just mine. And we, we need to maximize the workup of these biopsy specimens, especially these little ones. And we need to push for more tissue when it's needed, right? I mean, I've got clinical colleagues who think that you can get 50, 60 unstained slides out of a needle biopsy specimen. We need to explain to them that they, they if they want to give me one little dinky core, they're not going to get everything they say they want, right? 
and to push them to give multiple cores. And when you give the, and when they give multiple cores, I think it's valuable to put maybe one core in one block, another core in a different block, maybe another core in a third block, which is more expensive in terms of processing. But now you can look at an H&E of all three paraffin blocks, and then you can cut up one of them to do the diagnostic workup, and you have a block or two saved when they want these additional uh, molecular studies, which are which is going to be, in my opinion, uh, the norm. If it's not yet, it's going to be soon. Now, I've been talking almost entirely about the genes and the tumor. But of course, there's more to the picture. The microenvironment's a big part of the whole deal. Here's this paper by Kotloff that I think, uh, I'm just picking one because it was a big deal paper in Cancer Discovery. They're talking about all these different functional genes, expression signatures they can find in diffuse large B. But they say in this paper, there were four major lymphoma microenvironmental signatures. And if you go to the next slide here, you can see that uh, the GCB microenvironment does better than the uh, mesenchymal, I believe it was called. And then there's the uh, DP is the depleted one, lymphocyte depleted one, and N is the inflammatory one. Uh, so you can see the uh, the differences in survival just based on the signature of the microenvironment. And that, here's another slide, and up letter slide A, green is response to our chop. And you can see GCB has more green than the other three categories, right? So the microenvironment is also part of the picture. And I think we're going to somehow have to find a way to get that into the workup too before it's all said and done. I admit that right now we're not doing routinely microenvironmental type work on new cases of diffuse large B. We are doing NGS, but we're not doing microenvironment. All right. Now I'd like to sort of leave diffuse large B NOS. I think I have, I have plenty of time, I think, to do high grade B cell lymphomas. And to remind you, going back to the Who book, um, and I think I typed 2014 down here, but I meant to type 2017. Uh, you know, back in the revised Who, fourth edition, there were two types of high grade B cell lymphoma, right? There was the double, triple hit group. So these are people with MIC rearrangement and also BCL2 and or BCL6. And then the high grade B cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified group. Now this double hit business, one of my colleagues who's still here, Pei Lin, when she was a, you know, she's still a young woman, but she was younger then, of course. And she did this very nice paper looking at lymphomas, only 14, there were double hits with 1418s and uh, MIC rearrangements and basically saying most of them did relatively poorly. So I just want to give her a little kudos, but you know, it was a pathology paper and people kind of listened and kind of didn't until this paper came out in blood five years later from the Dutch group. And this is when the double hit business took off. So they defined double hit cases as having a MIC rearrangement plus a BCL2 or BCL6 or both or BCL3 or CCND1. Now, as the years went on, BCL3 became is a very rare event. So that much is written about that. And, and CCND1, of course, is cyclin D1. And, and most people say, no, those shouldn't be called double hit. Those should be called mantle cell lymphoma. Most of them are, uh, you know, blastoid or pleomorphic variant type things, right? So we're really talking about the BCL2, BCL6 group. Now, here's a nice looking case of diffuse large B cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 rearrangements. Something like 8 to 10% of cases of diffuse large B are double hits, right? They look like diffuse large B. They look aggressive. You can see a starry sky pattern here, apoptosis, high key 67, but you can't call this thing Burkitt or anything like that. Burkitt like this is diffuse large B. Look at the morphology, right? And so, you know, you had the situation with the fourth edition where if you called something, you could call it diffuse large B, then you might get the fish back in three or four days. And if it came back double hit, you had to change, you know, your diagnosis to high grade B cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 rearrangement, right? Or you could sort of punt and you could say aggressive B cell lymphoma pending fish. And you could wait four or five days until the until the fish is ready, right? You can do it that way too. Our clinicians don't like waiting four or five days for fish, so I would just call them diffuse large B. And then when they got correct, I had to correct them. And that always led to some interesting conversations. Uh, now here's a study by Shamin Hu in our department, an associate professor, and he went through about 400 cases of diffuse large B and pulled out the double hits, and they were doing terrible. 
uh, compared to the other diffuse large bees. Uh, and so, you know, basically in our institution, you know, every every single new case of diffuse large B gets a MIC rearrangement. And if that's rearranged, then we do the BCL2 and the, and the BCL6 for them. And then based on that, they will treat people differently here. Our CHOP, if they don't have the MIC, double hits. And often our EPOC, adding any toposide, if they are double hit. Not everybody agrees with that approach. It's a bit controversial, but that's how it's done here. <clears throat> now, in these, these double hit cases are interesting. So Cheox, another fellow in our department, very smart guy, associate professor. And we had this interesting scenario where we had a couple of patients come here with multiple relapses of diffuse large B. And they were coming here for uh, CAR-T treatment. And they had TDT. And this is just an example of one of them. In this case, the TDT is not very strong. Bottom right corner picture. But I mean, you know, I grew up in an era where we said TDT was pretty much, if it's in a lymphoma, it's a lymphoblastic lymphoma. And so one of the first ones of these cases, I think, you know, I said, you know, lymphoblastic transformation of diffuse large B, you know, some long, not fabulous diagnosis trying to deal with the problem. And the clinician called me up and said, hey, man, you can't do this. I said, why not? Because... If you do this, then I can't put the person on the protocol. They have to be diffuse larger B to be on the protocol. So I said, okay, I'll frame it in such a way that I can make it sound good for diffuse large B and, and mention the TDT and you can give them the right treatment. But I started thinking to myself, wait a minute, you know, why does TDT have to always make it lymphoblastic, especially if the thing has been a follicular lymphoma or a diffuse large B cell lymphoma? And so we started looking for these cases and she led the effort. And you can see that we had some that were double hit de novos. We had some that were fully lymphoma then went to double hit. We had some that were fully lymphoma and then went to diffuse large B, TDT, double hit TDT negative, then got TDT. Later, we had a couple other kinds of B cell lymphoma with TDT. We had a case of mantle cell lymphoma, for example, that had TDT. It was more partial. Uh, and so uh, we tried to get this paper published. And I have to tell you, the reviewers gave us a hard time in the beginning. Um, the first, you know, was first we sent it to, I think, the American Journal of Surgical Path. The reviewers said, this is terrible. Then I think it went to the American Journal of Clinical Path. The reviewers said it was terrible. Then I said to Dr. Konopoulos, he said, basically, Dr. Konopoulos said to me, Jeff, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not going to do anything with it. I think it's no good. I said, no, no, no. There's something here. And I put it on my desktop and we held on to it for about a year. And it just sat there. I looked at it every single day saying, I've got to figure out a way to sell this. And then she and I started talking and we came up with the scheme you just saw here. All these tumors are negative for CD34. So they're not, they have a mature phenotype, surface IG. As I mentioned, most of these are double hits. And the TDT, nobody knows exactly why it's there. Now, interestingly, if you go back to this paper I mentioned to you by Dr. Alizade, Dr. Stout, TDT was mentioned in this paper. Now, you can't see it, so let me give you another slide. Here it is. TDT is over, see it? TDT is overexpressed in the GCB group. It was right there in the 2000 paper. So that's interesting, no? So there's something about these double hit cases where TDT is being reactivated and, and you know, it fits right into the picture of diffuse large B and it doesn't make it a lymphoblastic tumor or anything like that. Now, there was a follow-up paper by Dr. Swerdlow where he showed gene mutations in these cases that are TDT positive also look more like diffuse large B than a lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma. Now, I've also mentioned BCL6 to you, and this is the one of the areas where the ICC and the WHO disagree. The ICC, these are being called high-grade B with MIC BCL6 rearrangements. In the new WHO, they're, they're, they're going to be called diffuse large B uh, NOS or possibly high grade B NOS with MIC and BCL6 rearrangements. People in the WHO are not convinced that this is a discrete entity. I'm showing you one picture of a case that we had in our department. This was a paper done by Dr. Landsberg at Pennsylvania, who you know looked at a whole bunch of double hits. You can see that two thirds of them are MIC BCL2, another 20% are MIC BCL2 and BCL6 and only 15% or so with MIC and BCL6. When you look at the MIC uh, double hit, triple hit cases, they're all GCB, 
they have a high frequency of TP53 gene mutations. If you look at the, MIC, the MIC BCL6 group, it's a different group. The prognosis is variable, some are GCB, some are non-GCB, and TP53 mutations are rare. And so I think it's a mistake to lump together Mick and you can you and I can disagree about whether you want to call these cases high grade B cell lymphoma with Mick and B cell six rearrangement or diffuse large B cell lymphoma with Mick and B cell six rearrangements. We can disagree about that, but I think what we can't disagree about is that the Mick B cell six group is a very different animal from the Mick B cell two and the triple hit group. And they need to be tri treated very separate, differently. And lumping them together is double, triple lymphoma, in my opinion, is a mistake. The bi and it, at knowing what BCL2 does normally, inhibiting apoptosis, and what BCL6 does normally, which is keeping things in the germinal center B cell program, it's no surprise to me that the biology is predict is, you know, this is a very different kind of group of cases. So in the new fifth edition of the WHO, the MIC BCL2 group or the triple hit group will be. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma slash high grade B cell lymphoma with MIC and B cell 2 rearrangements. Now, just to clarify this point, what they mean by this is that if it looks like diffuse large B, call it that. If it looks like high grade B cell lymphoma, call it that. Don't use this full term, diffuse large B slash high grade B. Don't do that, right? And part of the reason for doing this was so you don't have to call something diffuse large B and then seven days later reclassify the thing based on the fish results. So I kind of like it. Because, you know, if you call it diffuse large B and it's double it, it doesn't matter. It's okay. In terms of what you said originally, you still need an addendum, but you don't have to change anything. And then the, the, the MIC BCL2 cases are going to be called some variant of diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS. Or if they're high grade looking, you could probably put them there. And then we still have this high grade BNOS category. All right. Now, this is a very interesting paper and an important paper. There's a couple like it. So I don't want, I'm selling the UK group short who has a similar one, but this is coming out of Vancouver. 150 or so germinal center B cell cases. And they're doing sequencing and they come up with 104 gene expression signature that they call the MIC BCL2 double hit signature. And now people are calling it the dark zone signature. That's the new name, all right? Now from this group of cases that they did the signature on, um, 42 had the double hit signature. And they had fish results for MIC and BCL2 on 25 of the 42. And 22 of the 25 were double hit by fish, but three were not. And then they have 115 cases that do not have a double hit signature. And 25 of those were studied by MIC BCL2 fish. And three of the 25 were double hit by fish. See the issue? So in a sense, to try to put this into words, the fish can undercall double hit lymphoma. Why? Maybe the MIC rearrangement is too small to be detected, sort of a cryptic thing. Maybe MIC is being activated by mechanisms not recognized by fish. At the same time, the fish can, quote, overcall double hit lymphoma. These fish probes are very large. They cover lots of DNA. Maybe they detect, they may detect something that does not actually involve MIC or BCO2. I think I deleted a word there by accident. I'll fix it later. So, so the point is, you know, maybe there's a gene rearrangement near MIC or near BCL2, some other abnormality that um, could lead to the probe looking rearranged, even though the gene itself is not involved. So here's a paper from the Vancouver group a couple of years ago doing next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, I should say. Next generation technique, whole genome. The top line, light blue, shows that all six cases have a MIC rearrangement, and they all have a BCL2 rearrangement. But when you did the MIC fish, only three were positive. You do the BCL2 fish, only three were positive. See that? So the fish was not picking them all up. Then there, the rest of this slide is showing other sorts of abnormalities that are present, and then down here at the MIC overexpression by IHC. So basically six of 30, what is that? Three of, three of uh, two of 10, is that right? Two of 10, 20%, is that right? Of cases of, with a double signature, there were fish negative for MIC and BCL2 using the standard technique, had cryptic insertions of MIC or BCL2. They were being missed by standard fish. Picked up by whole genome sequencing. Now you might ask the simple question, well, you know, 
all this uh, chromosomal translocation stuff, genes, it's all interesting. But, you know, it, the, these things basically lead to overexpression of making BCL2. Can we just skip all this genetic stuff, go right to IHC, give the clinicians a result in two days or whatever? And, yeah, you can do IHC for these proteins. And, okay, what happens? And what we show here is in gold or yellow, that if you would double express making BCL2, you do worse than if you don't double express, which is blue, right? So the, the don't double express means MIC positive BCL2 negative and or MIC negative BCL2 positive or both negative versus the gold. And so double expressor lymphoma does worse than uh, non-double expressor lymphoma. In this particular study, I think they excluded the double hits first. But the message here is that double hit lymphoma is about 10% of all cases, double expressor lymphoma is about 30% of all cases right? Uh, and in general, the clinicians will not, in our hospital, our clinicians will not change therapy if a tumor is a double expressor. They will only change therapy if the tumor is double hit by genetics. And when people have looked at comparison of double hit genetics versus double expressor lymphoma, double hit group does worse. No question about that. All right, so here's a little cartoon my colleague Xiao, Li, Xiao Ying Li drew basically trying to highlight that the double expressor group in blue is almost all in the ABC category, just a few in GCB. The BCL2 rearrangement group is mostly GCB, very few ABC. And the double hit group is almost all GCB, right? And so double hit in red, or I don't know what color that is, something close to red, and the double expressor groups are very different. Now, our clinicians want to know if it's a double expressor. They want to know if it's double hit. But to be fair, our clinicians want to know everything they can know. Right. They're smart guys, meaning men and women. They're smart people and they want to know as much as you can give them. And very often, no matter what you give them, it's never enough. They want more. I'm OK with that. That's why they're good clinicians. Right. Now, I want to finish with just two minutes on high grade B lymphoma NOS. And this paper done by my colleague, Xiao Ying Li, and a very outstanding fellow, Lian Chun Chu, who is now a faculty member at the University of Washington. And they managed to collect up 136 patients with high-grade beast lymphoma NOS. And I think you can see this is uh, mostly at older adults and uh, more men than women. 20% had a history of flea lymphoma. Marrow is involved more commonly, 30%. Brain involvement more common. Extranodal sites multiple, more common. Elevated LDH, very common. High stage, very common. High IPI, very common. It's a bad group. The high-grade B-cell form morphology correlates with bad clinical features and prognosis. Let me just show you a couple of pictures of what I think is high-grade B-cell lymphoma. This is the Burkitt-like look. The tumor has a good starry sky pattern, all sorts of apoptosis top right. But if you look at this, uh, this uh, smear, sort of a, uh, not really a smear, it's a, uh, it's a smear, but it's, you know, you scrape the tissue with a knife and you make like a smear. It's not a typical cytology smear. It's sort of a knife smear. There's a name for it. I can't remember right now. I think you can see that there are some cells that are very big and then many cells that are intermediate. And so it's not a pure intermediate sized tumor. So it's not a Burkitt. So we call that Burkitt-like or high-grade B-cell form of Burkitt-like. These tumors have been around since, around since the beginning of time. Dr. Rappaport, Henry Rappaport, would call these undifferentiated non burkitt type in 1966, I think, in his fascicle. Okay, so this is one morphology of the high-grade cast. Here's the other morphology. Dr. Kanagal Shimana in our department wrote a little paper on this a while back. And they look a lot like a lymphoblastic lymphoma in terms of cell size, and the chromatin looks kind of granular or salt and pepperish, starry sky, mitotic figures, high key 67 but they're negative for TDT. Some of these are double hits. The rest that are not double hits would go into high-grade BNOS category. Now, here's a little picture of the pathology of this group. Uh, the little cartoon shows that about half the patients have MIC rearrangements, but they don't have coexisting MIC and BCL2 or MIC and BCL6. That's why they're sort of separate. And then I think here's the morphology. Intermediate means Burkitt-like blastoid is what I showed you guys. And then there's a high frequency of CD10, a high frequency of BCL2, GCB more common, high key 67. And then a complex karyotype is a very common event for the cases that got it, although we only studied 34 of them. Now, the last thing about this paper I want to mention is that uh, 
So Dr. Li, Xiao Ying Li and Dr. Chu, they they had some of these cases and they they did gene expression profiling on them. And um, they looked at double hit signature by the group in Vancouver and the paper by the UK. And they tried to look at those same genes. And basically what they show, and I'm boiling a big paper down into like 10 lines, is that half of these high graded B-cell bump NOS cases had a double hit like signature very much like what's been described by others. And these papers and the patients with the double hit signature did far worse than the people without the double hit signature. And that this double hit signature was present in 75% of the patients who had a MIC rearrangement. And it was present in a third of the patients who did not have a MIC rearrangement, right? And so how do you explain that? Uh, well, I guess one possibility to explain this would be that the double hit signature group that's in this NOS category might have some cryptic BCL2 or MIC rearrangements we're not picking up using uh, standard fish. Um, there may be other mechanisms that lead to activation of these groups. But I think my little take home message for myself, and hopefully you like the same one, is that this idea of trying to tell apart the few high-grade diffuse large B cases from high-grade B-cell NOS cases based on cell size may be a little arbitrary and may be a fool's errand, that maybe the way to go for the future is to divide these cases into those with the double hit signature and those without the double hit signature. And rather than have a large cell high-grade NOS group, go more for the molecular type of uh, subdivision of the cases. Um, so that's my, that's my ending. Um, uh, I have a couple of, uh, questions here at the end. I'm not sure. Let me ask Dr. Rafat here if I should move forward or should I, what should I do? Please, uh, please, Dr. Madeiras, of course. Just keep, go ahead and do the questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Thank you. So here's question. Let's just see if we can do this. Question number one, the IPI, everybody remember? So I'm asking you, which ones of these? are relevant, which one is not part of the IPI, right? Age, performance status stage, bone marrow, and number of extranodal sites. And the answer is, let me skip on down to the answer, bone marrow, right? That's not part of it. Apples, age, performance status, lactate dehydrogenase level, number of extranodal sites, and stage. So the bone marrow is part of extranodal sites, but it's really not part of the IPI itself. So that's question number one. I only have three, and they're not hard. I bet you you got that right. Here's question number two. The following statement about diffuse large B of GCB type is true, all right? The tumors have a high frequency of NF-kappa B activation. You can read these. They have uh, G mutations, B cell receptor signaling. The prognosis is worse than the ABC type. The MIC translocations are restricted to the GCB type. Genes involved in DNA methylation are in common in the GCB group, right? Okay, so everybody take a moment, pick your letter. I'll wait like, I don't know, five seconds. So I'll look at my watch. And the answer to number two is I have to skip ahead because I see the MIC translocations are virtually restricted to the GCB group. NF kappa B activation and B cell receptor signaling are more common in the ABC group. GCB tumors do better than patients in the ABC group. And mutations in DNA methylation genes, you know, chromatin modification genes, you know, KMT2D, Kreb B, uh, Easy H2, these are all more common in the GCB group, right? The ABC group is more the NF kappa B gene mutations. All right, that was question number two. Let's go back to question three. All right. Uh, the following statements about diffuse large B high grade B cell lymphoma with MIC BCL2 rearrangements are true, except. So I'm going back the other way now. One's going to be wrong. These neoplasms are almost always GCB. Proliferation rate, that says rare, but it should be rate, is variable. MIC can partner with IG, non IG genes. They have a dark zone signature. These patients are generally thought to have a poorer prognosis. All right, go ahead, pick one, five second delay. All right, there you go. So 
question three. That's one, that's two here. Okay. This I'm trying to be a little tricky with you guys. Hey, Jesse, can I call you right back? I'm in the middle of Zoom, okay? Thank you. Sorry, you guys. I uh, I should have, you know, made the phone mute there for a minute. Okay, so I'm being a little tricky here because, you know, I'm asking you to remember that study by Anishi showing that the double hit signature uh, correlates with poor prognosis, but it's only present in about half the cases that we're calling double hit using FISH, MIC, and BCL2. It's not present in the other half, right? So I'm, I, maybe this is a little unfair because I'm saying, you know, uh, usually, right, means most. But it's not most. It's about half have the double hit signature, about half don't have the double hit signature. So maybe it's not the best question. But you see the point I'm trying to get, that what we're calling fish right now, uh, what we're calling double hit by fish um, is, is, ins is, a, is a gross tool and probably uh, an insensitive tool. That is overcalling certain cases and undercalling other cases, and that we're missing theoretically about half the patients who have that double hit signature or the dark zone signature, and these are the ones that have the worst uh, prognosis. And in my, and what we're trying to do here, and we're slow about it, is to put the double hit signature as part of the routine workup of patients, new patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Now, you know, listen, we're 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 MD Anderson, you know, we call ourselves number one and all that. Uh, you know, we got clinicians who were trying to be famous. Uh, you could argue there were ivory tower and they were overdoing things a little bit. I can't argue with you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I do think uh, we need to improve our ability to work up these diffuse large B cases and pick out the worst actors. And this signature may be the best way uh, to do that. And I think fish is uh, just a start, not the best way. So I thank you all for your time. What can I, What anything else we need to do? Any questions uh, or anything? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Madeira. Just a couple of questions. Actually, there is one comment here from one of our viewers who is watching on Facebook. Uh, the first uh, comment, let me read it for you, that uh, I'm very much impressed with this lecture because it has deep understanding coming out of past experience and gives us a hope not to succumb to novelties with a lot of molecular testing in vain, which proves nothing but quite tiresome and overburdened for a regular pathologist. So that is one comment. And the same viewer has another comment or a question that, uh, um, is it all about to treat patients with bad cases of lymphoma with new series of monoclonal antibodies till they resist the treatment? How helpful it is. Do you have any comment to add, Dr. Medeiros, please? Uh, I, I'm not sure I totally uh, get the question, but let me tell you what I think I get. And, and that is, I mean, the dream scenario would be to have a kind of therapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma that cures the patient with zero toxicity. That's the uh, that's that's the dream, right? And so a lot of these new monoclonal antibodies that work, they you know like rituximab for example has an important role in improving survival of people with diffuse large B cell lymphoma and has relatively little toxicity. So that's an example of of uh, what we'd like to see, right? So you want to cure the, so in the general with lymphomas in general, you want to cure the patient. Often you have a very aggressive chemotherapy regimen to do that. And then you give them all sorts of side effects like, you know, I don't know, radiation induced sarcomas and, and secondary leukemias and all this kind of stuff. And then you want to get the same achievement with less toxicity. So this is the Hodgkin story, right? I mean, we're curing like 80, 90% of patients with Hodgkin, but we're leaving toxicity. So we're trying to modify the regimen to, to treat people with Hodgkin with less toxicity. And the dream would be to treat people with Hodgkin with drugs that have no toxicity, which, which may be far away, but everybody has to have a dream, right? So this would be the same thing in diffuse blood B. Can we understand the tumor's morphology, not morphology, genetics, the pathways involved, and then take a mixture of, of two or three drugs and uh, treat that patient in such a way that the tumor responds with minimal toxicity. Now, probably what's going to happen over the next 50 years is that you know they're going to get our chop. Then at some point it's going to be our chop plus ibrutinib, our chop plus ibrutinib and the netoclax. And then, you know, maybe 
Maybe we're doing six cycles of our chop. Then maybe we, we, if we have success with these new regiments, we might go to three cycles of our chop plus two or three of these other antibodies, right? And then maybe someday it'll be two, three, four antibodies and truly minimal chemotherapy for patients who never, and people would not get any sort of side effects from the treatment. So is that hopefully is answering your question, but that may be 50 years away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Medeiros. There is another question uh, from another viewer who asks, uh, what is the best way to differentiate centroblast versus immunoblast in DLBCL? Yeah. And in the new WHO classification, large atypical centrocytes versus centroblasts. I think, uh, did you did I read it correctly, Dr. Medeiros? I, yeah, I think that's okay. So, um, you know, I think... Uh, so basically, the way people treat immunoblasts is they, they want the tumors to be relatively pure, right? So in my opinion, cells that are immunoblastic, they're over 80-90% of the with nuclei that have that big central prominent basophilic nucleolus, often kind of rectangular trapezoidal, not always round, and these little strands of chromatin coming off the nucleolus and attaching to the nuclear membrane that I like to just call spider legs. And that, that to me is an immunoblast. And centroblasts, as you know, have more vesicular chromatin, two or three nucleoli. Usually two of the nucleoli are sort of attached to the nuclear membrane once more centrally placed. Now, I do believe that there are cases of diffuse large B we see that are clearly centroblastic or clearly immunoblastic. And maybe that's half all, of, maybe that's half of all the cases. The other half, it's too hard to tell. I acknowledge that. I'm not trying to suggest that the morphology is better than the genetics so that we can do these things by morphology always and reliably. I'm only trying to suggest that tumors look the way they look for a reason, and only we as pathologists see what they look like, and we can try to use that information, hopefully, to improve our understanding of the disease. And wouldn't it be nice if we could maybe discover something about these tumors at the morphologic level that would be somewhat predictive of what the genetics might be. So that in a scenario where the resources are not very good, we could actually say, hey, look, this one has a pretty good chance of being, I don't know, MCD type, because it's got this kind of morphology, this kind of mitotic rate, blah, blah, blah. No? So, so I think we should try to use the morphology and try to push the morphology and try to correlate the morphology with these genetic findings, because in my mind, we're pathologists. That's what we're supposed to do. And if we don't do it, who the heck's going to do it? The clinicians don't want to do it, right? So when people say to me things like, ah, the morphology doesn't matter, it, you know, it bugs me. Now, I admit, look at my hair. It's white. I've been in this space a long time. I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy. I acknowledge that. My two children complain like hell I'm old-fashioned. But to me, the morphology means something, and we should try to figure out what the heck it means rather than saying it's nothing. Who cares, right? It's not going to matter for treatment anyway. Now, I want to remind you about this, this. Before I stop complaining, let me just give you one more little example. I am old enough to remember the days when people talked about acute lymphoblastic leukemia and non-acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I remember those days. I know most of you don't. I rem you probably all remember the days when we talked about small cell carcinoma of the lung and non-small cell carcinoma of the lung. Remember those days? That's not too far away, okay? And that's and that and people said it doesn't really matter. Well, do the clinicians feel that way now? I mean, obviously, whether it's squamous or adenal means something in the lung cancer world, and we should try to do something with it. I think the same thing's true in lymphoma. So this is old fashioned. I acknowledge it, but I do think we should try to be up to date with all the new stuff because it's important. But at the same time, remember that the way things look must mean something. Maybe we can figure it out. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Medeiros. Actually, there is a question from one of our viewers on the same line. So who says, in a limited resource setting, if you have to select cases to subject for further molecular testing, what should be the criteria? Yeah, that's a good question. I think... Um, you know, I think this the GCB ABC model, which I've criticized, has some value in terms of uh, maybe selecting who needs the fish, right? I mean, almost all the double hit patients are in the GCB group, right? So I think if you have an older patient that is a GCB tumor, CD10 positive, for example, 
and a you know set brisk k67 70 80% you know strong bcl2 positivity those are the ones likely to be double hit and they should be tested and the ones that are abc type or bcl2 totally negative uh, or, you know, you can use the MIC IHC in a similar manner. The high mix are more likely to be double hit the low mix or not. Now, none of these are perfect. And if you try to pick the GCB group with some MIC and BCL2, you're going to miss a few. But theoretically, you would get most of them. Now, I do think, though, as I've said to you, even though that would be useful to stratify the workup for the, for the fish, it's still not the answer, right? The fish is only half the answer. So, uh, you know, the, the ultimate goal here, I think, is they're going to need to be sent for next generation uh, uh, sequencing and for the double hit signature or the gene expression signature, not double, not sequencing, but the signature. And, and I think the same things I'm saying that we, you could use for fish, I think you could also use if you were going to send them for the double hit signature. It would not surprise me if one of these commercial companies is already doing it or will soon develop a double hit signature assay that you can send off to get. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maderas. I think that you have answered this question. That there, there was a related question from a few of our viewers, but I will not ask you that again. So the next question is, can you comment on high-grade B-cell lymphoma with 11Q aberration? Now that's a toughie. Uh, so, you know, to me, so in the new WHO, I believe, we're calling that high-grade B slash diffuse large B cell lymphoma with 11Q aberration. Uh, so there are cases out there. So basically, the way I do that is, if it looks like it's Burkitt and it doesn't have MIC rearrangement, I worry about the 11Q aberration. And, and then try to send that off for that assay. Right. So, I mean, they're high grade tumors. They're usually younger people and they're high grade, in my experience, and they're high grade tumors and they have high key 67 and they look a lot like Burkitt, but they don't have the, they don't have the mix. So I would kind of, it's a very rare entity. So that's kind of how I'm doing it. I might be missing a couple. It wouldn't surprise me. One last question, Dr. Medeiros. Uh, what is your experience in Hodgkin lymphoma relapsing as DLBCL? I've seen it. Um, and more than once, uh, why? That's a better question, uh, an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, these treatments, I mean, so we'll take Hodgkin, you know, the standard therapies, ABVD. Uh, now they're getting rid of the V and they're putting in uh, rituximab. So now it's A for Incetris, B, they're getting rid of the bleo and then keeping the vin, the vinblastine and the, the carbazine. Um, I I think you know that these chemotherapies do cause some immune deficiency, right? So people with Hodgkin lymphoma have immune deficiency anyway, even before you treat them. That's been well known. And then you treat them with chemotherapy, hopefully successfully. And now they, I believe, the chemotherapy also induces some immune deficit. Uh, and um, you know how that leads theoretically to either chronic antigenic stimulation and or decreased host immunosurveillance uh, might lead then to a second tumor. So they could be totally independent. I, I, you know, listen, if you have Hodgkin in your 20s and you get diffuse large B in your 50s, theoretically it could be independent, right? But I do think probably some of them are related because the, the therapy for the Hodgkin um, um, has some sort of impact on the host immunosurveillance and maybe makes you more at risk for chronic antigenic stimulation. So, and then as you know, uh, your example specifically was Hodgkin, but we've seen people with CLL who have gotten treated with um, uh, fludarabine and drugs like that, and they later get diffuse large B or EBV positive diffuse large B uh, related, I think, to the chemotherapy as much as they're related to the uh, to transformation, it's it's not really a Richter per se. It's it's an EBV positive thing that may be related to the immune deficiency of, of related to the therapy for the CLL. And so we've seen sort of what I would call, and we suggested the term here years ago, sort of cancer therapy related immunodeficiency lymphoproliferative disorders, right? So they can happen from HIV, they can happen from a primary immunodeficiency, they can they can happen from from transplant. 
I think they also can happen from cancer therapy itself, particularly people who get multiple multiple different kinds of therapy because they fail, you know, the first round and the second round. And and so I think there is a relationship there, but I don't know what it is. So I have to say, I don't know to explain how. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Medeiros. I think oh, we have come to the end of the Q&A session as well. And thanks a lot for this excellent talk. And there are a lot of compliments from our viewers and for this great presentation. And Dr. Medeiros, you would be happy to hear that we had over 200 viewers who joined from different parts of the world. I could keep track of uh, our colleagues who joined from far off places as Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, Tanzania, Great Britain, Yemen, Cambodia, Argentina, Mexico, Philippines, uh, India. And thanks to our viewers. And uh, I would like to request you to follow Patcast. And we have a YouTube channel. Channel, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast and follow our Facebook page. And we also have a Twitter account you can follow so that you can stay updated with the upcoming lectures. And also don't forget to subscribe to our or follow our Instagram account as well. And our next lecture is actually our third lecture on HEMPAD. So that would be on cutaneous lymphoma. So that is actually uh, next month. So stay updated and uh, stay tuned. So we will keep you posted. And thank you again, Dr. Madeiras. Thank so you. Much. Appreciate hearing about all those people listening. That's pretty amazing. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks so much.